morning and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church this morning. I have a couple of announcements this morning. It is the Pittsburgh Music Academy is proud to present the return of the concerto workshop. It's a free concert today that will be held at 2 p.m. in here in the sanctuary. The concert is open to the public and the program will feature soloists playing the piano, violin, cello, viola, flute, and include concertos by some artists that I can't pronounce their names, but the one that I can is Mozart, Vivaldi, Hayden, Haydn, and the orchestra is comprised of members of the American Federation of Musicians and is underwritten generously with a grant from the Musicians Performance Trust Fund. So please come out if you're not busy today. And my next announcement is about Sean Bame, who generally works behind the scenes here to keep everything running smoothly. And he has the opportunity to do something that he fell in love with over the past couple years in the pandemic, and that's tennis. Sean will be leaving his position as director of facilities and project management to coach youth tennis in the South Hills of Pittsburgh. While he was on, while he will, while he'll still be on staff for the next six weeks, we will not have the opportunity to see him in Sunday worship for a while. And he and Jody plan to remain active members of the congregation when he is done. In his time here, Sean has been able to make changes that will have a lasting impact on the future of our congregation. So let's give Sean thanks for six years of a job well done. And keep your eyes open to your email for an opportunity for, to give further thanks and appreciation. And with all that, I invite you to take a deep breath in and out and turn our hearts to worship while listening to the prelude. Behold the gathering of God's own, beside believers and among apostles, drawn together as disciples and doubters, 
we are shoulder to shoulder with shepherds and saints. Since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Let us worship God together. Where are all the children hiding? Come on up. Yay, good to see all of you. Would you like to sit on the steps? Yeah? I'll sit right next to you, okay? All right. Okay, so I brought a piggy bank. Does it look like a piggy bank? Yeah. It's a, go ahead. It's a, um, it's, a bread. it's a bready bank, yeah. It's a loaf of bread, uh-huh, with a hole in it. 
for you to put your coins in. This is the bank that the kids all went home with during vacation Bible school to, to put all their coins in to go towards our food pantry. Some kids brought in canned goods, non-perishables. Other kids filled their banks and brought them in. So I have a piggy bank, and I wanted to know, how often do you put money in your piggy bank at home? What? <laughs> Mom and Dad. Do you just spend, are you one of those ones that spends your money as soon as you get it? You never get money. <laughs> oh, we're going to have to do something about that, aren't we? Anybody else put money in a piggy bank? You don't get money either, Nora? No money for Nora either? Okay. Anybody else put money in a piggy bank? Yes. Good. Okay, so... Um, mom's bedroom. Oh, there's a big box of it in your mom. Oh, small red box. Well, maybe you can ask your mom if you could take some of those coins and put them in your bank, right? Oh. Your pig is lonely. <laughs> okay, so some people at the end of the day put all the change from their pockets or their wallet into a piggy bank. I know who used to do that, Mr. Rombaugh. Remember Mr. Rombaugh? He would save up all his coins, and he would donate it to your class for um, Pete the Pig. Do you remember the Pete the Pig project, anyone? Oh, you guys were too young. Where we raised, hmm? Pete the Pig is when we raised money for uh, people who have leprosy. It's a disease. And he would share all of his coins with us during that. Yeah. So he put his money every day into a jar. Okay, so whether we use a piggy bank or a savings account at a bank, it's a good idea to have a plan to save money for unexpected emergencies or when we want to do something special. But we have to be careful that saving money doesn't become the most important thing in our life. Why do you think I say that? That's right. Would you like to do the lesson today? <laughs> you, just, you just said it. You just said it. So, in the Bible, Jesus warned his friends and the people who followed him about making money the most important thing to them. Anybody ever see a big stack of money? Big stack of bills? Do you have play money at home? There you go. There you go. Don't you like to have the most money in Monopoly? Okay, there you go. And also we got um, a game on TV, and it's the same game. Oh, okay, cool. There you go. So Jesus said, don't worry too much about building up treasures on earth. He meant, don't worry too much about money and things. Instead, spend your time building up treasures in heaven. So instead of putting money in this piggy bank, let's store up treasures in heaven by putting in things we think would be treasures in heaven. What might be a treasure in heaven? What kind of things could you do that would store up treasures in heaven? Like, it would be like you're putting money, you're putting a treasure into a bank. Doing something good. Doing something good. That's right. You're building up your, your wealth full of good things that you do for other people. And that's called um, storing your treasures in heaven. So, how about giving money to the poor? Can you think of anything else? What other things can you do? Other good things. Go ahead. That's right, the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. Visiting the sick. Anybody else? Uh, helping to feed the hungry. And also donating money to help people. Donating your money to help people. That's right. 
um, being cheerful and thoughtful to someone who is sad. That doesn't even involve money, does it? Being a friend who shares them with their That's exactly right. Praying for one another, working in a shelter for the homeless, being a friend to someone who is lonely, like you said. Yeah. What was I going to say? I don't know. It'll come to me. You let me know. Forgiving someone who has hurt you. Forgiveness, right? That's an important one. And saying sorry when you hurt someone. I may be wrong, but I may do something on accident. Breaking something on accident and saying you're sorry, yes. That, okay. That's what I mean. Yes, sorry. just to break something, right, right. So all the things we talked about can be treasures in heaven. They might not seem like much, but if we do something for someone each and every day, it is amazing how quickly your bank of treasures in heaven fills up. Yes. Forgiving somebody. Forgiving somebody. That's right. You remembered. See? So let's uh, bow our heads in prayer, and we're going to go do an activity after. Dear God, we may never have much money or very many things, but help us to be faithful each day in building up treasures in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reflection today is from Isaiah chapter 4, chapter 5, I'm sorry, verses 1 through 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it only yielded bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and the men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, with briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice but saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. This is the word of our Lord. And now the call to confession. Gathered before the throne of God's infinite mercy, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, confessing our need for grace. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Loving creator, with a gardener's tender touch, you planted your people to bear good fruit, but we bear wild grapes. With a welder's fierce fire, you fashioned your people to glorify you, but we are riddled with impurities. In your generous mercy, O oh God, regard the vine you planted, save and restore us. Reform the vessel you crafted, Cleanse and refine us. Give us life, O God, that with our whole being we may worship you rightly. Please join in a moment of silent confession.
Jesus endured the cross and disregarded its shame for the sake of the joy that was set before him. That joy is our salvation. His joy is our freedom. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Now let us share the peace of Christ with one another.
Will you pray with me? Faithful God, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sanctify us by your word and spirit so that we may glorify you in the company of the faithful through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The second scripture reading this morning comes from Hebrews. It's in chapter 11, verses 29 through chapter 12, verse 2. Listen now for the word of the Lord. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength, out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received their dead by resurrection, others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and ghosts, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all of these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want you to take a second and think about what your favorite place in God's creation is. One of my top two is under the stars. In fact, Friday night, I went to a star party, which is where you go away from city lights and stare at the dark night sky for a couple of hours. And it's pretty exciting when the stars go shooting across the sky. It's definitely a time for a God moment, to appreciate the beauty in God's creation, but also how big God's creation is and how little we are in comparison. How God could even listen to my little prayers when God can do such big and amazing things. Often, when I reflect on Bible passages, I think back to these moments. Most of those reflections have been from the Gospel of Luke this summer, but that's where the lectionary is at. And we've been learning much about the life and the teachings of Jesus. When we learn about the promises of Jesus, we can move forward in life knowing that no matter what, we cannot be separated from that love in Christ. Not death, nor life, angels, nor demons, things present, future, powers, heights, depth, nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. We get to walk through this life with the assurance that we are loved and cared for even in death. We get to walk through this life with a peace that surpasses all understanding with the comfort of God who reigns over all. Reading the Bible post-resurrection and post-ascension kind of changes our thinking about things. 
People in the Old Testament, however, were still waiting for the new covenant. They were waiting for the Messiah to come to earth so that the world might be saved. The letter to the Hebrews talks about faith, but talks about it from the lens of a lot of the Old Testament characters. These people lived in a time where they were still awaiting the coming Messiah. They didn't yet have the promises of Jesus incarnate in the world. So the writer starts off the chapter with God at creation. God created the world out of nothing. Then takes examples from Genesis to talk about faith. So Cain, Abel, Enoch, the grandfather of Noah and Noah. Then it goes into further depth about Abraham. And this part about Abraham, I think, gives the whole, the reading from today further context. Abraham was called out of his home in Horan to a new land. God told him that God would make Abraham into a great nation and bless him. Abraham did not know where he was going, and it was all unfamiliar to him, but he still obeyed, and he got there. And it ended up being his inheritance. He went in obedience to what God was calling him to do instead of just seeking land for himself. There are other ways that Abraham was faithful to God, like when, Abra when God promised Abraham children in a vision, and even though Sarah was past her childbearing years, they trusted God's words. And she conceived even so late in life. And when they finally had a child, Isaac, God asked Abraham to offer up his only son as a sacrifice. And as Abraham took the knife out, God told him to stop. And just as God promised Abraham as many descendants as the numerous stars in the sky, I love this imagery, not only because I love the stars, but the vision that I mentioned a few minute ago, when God promised Abraham that he would have many children, it got dark. It said a terrifying darkness fell on him. And I imagine that it's the type of dark that you can't see your own body right in front of your face. And terrifying, like when somebody turns off the lights when you're trying to walk and all of a sudden you can no longer move. But I also imagine it to be the kind of dark where you can see so many stars that you can no longer see the constellation amongst the vast amount. And some sit still, some shoot across the sky and you find yourself so lost in the moment that you can't see around you even if you wanted to. And it's under these conditions that is where God tells Abraham that he will have as many descendants as stars in the sky if he can even count them. And Abraham would live to be old and die one day in peace. The covenant between Abraham and God had taken place. It's interesting to me, though, that God did everything God promised, yet Abraham wasn't alive for all of those promises. Abraham lived faithfully, always following where God was leading, and yet some of God's promises happened after Abraham's death, which is the possession of the land and the many descendants. And Abraham remained faithful, and God's promises were fulfilled, even if it didn't happen in the way that Abraham thought that it might. The letter then moves on to more examples of faith from the Old Testament, like how faithful the Israelites were when Egypt, when in Egypt, even though the Pharaoh refused to let them go. And this was a rough time for them, but they remained faithful and they did as the Lord instructed. God got them out of their captivity and God had a plan to take a different route than they ordinarily would have went. And God led them, pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. God's plan was to make it look like the Israelites were confused, like they didn't know where they were going. But the plan was also to go through the Red Sea. We're all familiar with this story. It's hard to imagine, though, what the average Israelite was thinking in that moment. This is crazy. We're lost. Or what is happening to the sea? Are we supposed to walk through there? But they were faithful. They did the things, and they were saved. God told Gideon that he had too many men to fight the Midianites. So Gideon sent home a large portion of his army, and the Midianites had a huge army, and Gideon was left with 300. And Gideon still faithfully fought in battle and won with a few 
that he had. Barak, Samson, and Jephthah all have similar stories of faithfully following God's word and winning in battle. Rahab saved her whole family when she hid some spies and some flax on her rooftop. She knew that the Lord had given them land and she had faith. So she helped them. When the time came for them to take the city, Rahab and her family were saved. David, a king, lived a life of devotion to God. And of course, there is the obvious allusion to Daniel. There was a decree that anyone who prayed to God or prayed to anybody except for King Darius would be thrown into the lion's den. And this decree did not stop Daniel who faithfully got down on his knees to pray three times a day, just like always. So he was thrown into the lion's den, and it was sealed with a rock. God of the faithful sent an angel to shut the mouths of the lions, and he was saved. And then furthermore, the king issued another decree saying that everybody in his kingdom must fear and have reverence for the God of Daniel. We are told of those who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, quenched raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war and foreign armies to flight. After name dropping the Old Testament people and their stories, this passage moves into when people were having hard times and living in times of distress People whose weakness turned into strength in times of war and torture, suffering and imprisonment. Even people who thought the world thought wasn't worthy, God uses them too. They are commended for their faith and God provides something better than what they could have ever imagined for themselves. All of these stories of people of great faith, it's moving and inspiring. And it's easy to think of these stories as just having happened so long ago that they have no relevance for the here and the now, or they cannot possibly pertain to the suffering that we go through today. I mean, not many of us are going to war, and the only lion I have ever seen is at the zoo. We live in a different world, in a world full of gun violence and car crashes, cyber bullies and house fires, COVID and monkeypox, substance abuse and cancer. The list of the ways that our suffering has changed is endless. But a few things maintain the same and the same importance. And among that list is that God is faithful to us and we should remain faithful to God. There are so many stories about people who cling to their faith when things are difficult, who fall to their knees in times of prayer, asking for strength in times of trial. There are plenty of stories from, for example, 9-11, when people remained faithful throughout that tragedy, even while just clinging to the promises that God will bring them home to heaven. It is only through the strength that God provides that I made it through quitting my job and getting through seminary and the soul-expanding processes that that comes with. And in fact, I don't know how many of you knew this, but prior to seminary, I absolutely refused to pray out loud unless the words were written for me by somebody else. And I would have never preached. You can ask Dennis. I refused to preach. But by faith, here I am today. And those were both very hard things for me to do, but God gave me strength and courage, and the education helped too. Seeking justice, quenching fires, escaping the sword, being strong in time of weakness are not easy tasks. And sometimes the tasks of our lives seem like a mountain that is too big to begin to tackle, and we can't do it on our own. God is faithful though. If we are opening our eyes to what's happening around us and are looking for it, we can see how we are provided for. Sometimes it is our food that we are blessed to have every day. Sometimes 
We do not have enough money to meet our needs and someone reaches out to help. Sometimes we have too much to do and it seems like our tasks will never get done and people step in and help. God provides people willing at just the right time sometimes. This week I was feeling a bit overwhelmed with my to-do list that I made for myself. And time and time again this week, people have selflessly stepped in and volunteered to help. Each time things like this happen, I give a prayer of thanksgiving to God for the people in my life or for sustaining nourishment and resources and for every simple or large thing. And of course, this faith in God does not mean that everything will happen the way we want it to or in our timing. But Abraham did not receive the things God promised until after his death. God is bigger than we are. Most importantly, we need to be faithful in the promises of God. That God loved the world so much that God sent Jesus to redeem us and to redeem the world. I wonder, how are you struggling to be faithful? What in your life is weighing you down right now? Have you stopped to pray about it? Have you tried to talk it out with God? Ask for clarity, ask for discernment, ask for wisdom, ask for peace. I'm sure that Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah were unsure of the exact outcomes. In fact, the Bible says that Gideon was afraid so he had to go and listen to the Midianites talking about a dream they had that said that Gideon would win, and then he went to battle. But they still had faith in God, and that word, the word of God is true, and so too should we cling to those promises. Will you play with me? God of sovereignty, when we struggle to be faithful, help us to know you are near. When times are hard, help us to know how much we are loved. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, help us to lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so close. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen.
And will you pray with me? Loving God, we give you thanks today for cooler days for us to enjoy. We give you thanks for the air for us to breathe and the ground for us to walk on and cultivate. For all of those who are hungry but now are fed, or all of those who were sick and now are healed, and for all of those willing to selflessly give to further your kingdom and to help others. Surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, we pray for the fulfillment of God's promise. We pray for the church universal, be with all of the faithful people as they seek to serve you, as they seek to be faithful to you, God. Make us bold to proclaim our faith in Christ, who endured the cross for our sake and now sits at the right hand of your throne. We pray for this crazy world. Create peace in places where war is tearing apart communities and distress is causing societies to break down. Show your mercy and justice to the nations and to all people. Defend the weak and powerless, and lift up the lowly and the destitute. And we ask that your presence be felt in this community and in this church. And we ask that your healing presence be felt near to those who are mending, such as in the life of Marilyn Sprout, who is moving out of Friendship Village tomorrow and into her daughter's home until she's able to walk steady. Be with her as she is on the mend. Restore the vineyard you have planted. Let it not be trampled down, but grow up to bear good fruit. We pray for loved ones, especially Karen Asbury, who is suffering with Alzheimer's, and David Asbury, who is caring for her. Protect them with your powerful hand. Give life to all those who call on your name, and let your face shine and save them. Strengthen us to run the race that is before us, laying aside the heavy burdens of our sin and death and following the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now is the time that we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And as you look around and see the people who are being faithful, the people who are stepping up and volunteering their time and the things that we are accomplishing in our mission at this place, I want you to consider how you are to give into that with your time, your talents, and your treasures. How is God calling you to fulfill the wants and the will of his kingdom.
give you thanks and praise, O oh God, for you have chosen the poverty of the world to make your people rich in faith. Help us to put our faith into practice through the offering of our lives, giving food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, and shelter to the poor, all for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, your word made flesh. Amen. be dismayed by the brokenness of this world. Things are always breaking, but things are always mending, not with time as they say, but with intention. So go, love extravagantly and unconditionally because the broken world waits in the darkness for the light that is you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you now and always. Amen. 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 